The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connor. Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome along to this brand new 2017 edition of The World You Don't Know with myself, Mick O'Connell. It is a brand new year, and I'd like to wish you all a very happy new year. Hope you all had a great Christmas. Now, we do have a guest lined up. Um, well, hopefully lined up. She's supposed to be on Skype now. Um, she was on just before Christmas on the show that I had with Freeman, um, Christina Delaney. Um, she's coming on to talk about the GAA again and the medal presentation that occurred down in Tipperary there just before Christmas when they presented the winning Tipperary team with real, authentic, original all Ireland medals um, handcrafted from gold and silver donated um, to the IRB from the people of Ireland and they had these medals pressed and given in a presentation by Billy Maguire to the winning team, the members of the winning team for Tipperary um, beautiful looking medals as well you can go on to um, billymaguire.com you can see the medals there they have, have pictures of them up there um, and they're actually some very nice medals and hopefully we'll, Christina will come on tonight and um, we've got a good few things to talk about um, we'll be supposed to do a catch up on what's gone on during the year, the um, centenary year of 2016 and how that was I suppose hijacked, for want of a better word by Fine Gael and Labour who, as I said before on a show many, many moons ago 50 years ago at the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising Labour and Fine Gael boycotted all the events so, you know, go figure that a hundred years or fifty years later, for the hundredth anniversary, they decide that they will take the the lead, as it were, in organising all the events that we see nationally um, around the country, particularly the the big events in Dublin's O'Connell Street. Um, as I said, fifty years previous, they had boycotted them, so it was a bit of a, you know, a, a smack in the face to real Republicans that they would take over them. This time around. Anyway, Christine is not on Skype for some reason. I don't know why. So you're just going to have me for the next while until she um, ha- hopefully appears. I have sent her a text message. So hopefully she will come on. And um, we're going to be talking about um, an upcoming event as well on the 21st of January. Um, it's Ireland's Independence Day for those of my listeners who don't know. Um, you're going to have the event in the Mansion House at 12 noon. The turning of the Sovereign Seal. Um, officiated over by Billy Maguire himself the president of the IRB and it's a very significant and important event that has been airbrushed out of the history books by the mainstream media by the government and by vested interests I suppose to keep it under wraps um, to what this event actually signifies and what it signifies is every year on the 21st of January as it says it's Ireland's Independence Day and we have this ceremony in the Mansion House that Goes by unnoticed most years, unfortunately. I mean, it should be on RTE all day. It should be a live RTE event. Um, if there was any sort of justice in this world, but as we know, there's not. And there's a good reason for that, and I'm going to get into that. Every year, as I said, the event takes place, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I, I will hopefully talk to Billy Maguire as well and get him on the show um, in the run-up to the 21st to have a chat about it. Now, basically what the event is, is the turn of the Sovereign Seal. And what it does is... It validates all licences issued by the state for the following year. That is the nature of the, the, the event. Basically, as I've said before on this show, and I'm sure anyone listening who knows the true history of what went on in this country, in 1918, there was a 32-county All-Ireland general election. Um, and the IRB won the mandate to run this country. Now, of course, the British didn't like that, and they instigated the Civil War. And then in 1922, we had the Oireachtas foisted upon this country by the British, by King James V. Now, you can check out Article 17 of Says That Ireland, if you don't believe me. That's the oath of allegiance taken by members of the Oireachtas. And it's an oath of allegiance to King George V, his heirs and successors, namely Queen Elizabeth, today. And that's in the Free State Handbook, Says That Ireland. Now, don't get me wrong, we've got the 1937 Constitution now, but we still have the Oireachtas. So who's their oath of allegiance to? Is it to the people of Ireland or is it to the British Crown? I mean, these are serious questions that need to be answered. And it certainly goes a long way to understanding the mess that this country is in today. That we haven't been really running our own affairs for the last hundred years. That they've been getting run for us. And this is the kind of stuff that has been suppressed by the history books. And as I said, there's been a very good reason for it. 
like I said, we've had the Oireachtas foisted upon this country in 1922. And you can ring up government buildings today. Ring them up tomorrow if you want. I'm sure you'll get the phone number in the phone book and ask them, is the Oireachtas and the Irish government a provisional set up, a provisional government? And they will tell you, yes, it is. It's provisional. It's not de jure, it's provisional. Which means they were put in place. Not because the people wanted them in place, but they were put in place. And of course, when you go back nearly 100 years, like people back then didn't have the kind of communications facilities that we have now, like the internet, books, magazines. All you had was the word on the street and you didn't even have radio back then. You didn't, certainly didn't have television. So most people wouldn't have known what was really going on. You know, most people would have been worried about what was going on in their own corner of the world, you know, in their own home, looking after their own family, their own children, and that's fairly understandable. But in 1916 and run up to 1916, there was a lot of intellectuals who did know what was going on and wanted to change things. And they did. They tried to. As I said, in 1918, we had a 32-county general election. And as Billy McGuire points out, yeah, and he will point this out on the 21st, there's five governments operating in this country, believe it or believe it not, on the island of Ireland itself. One, you've got the, the, the government that's in place now. You've got the European Union operating here. You've got the Crown operating here. And then you've got the Northern Ireland government. And then the only other government that is a legitimate government who don't actually sit is the original doll. The one mandated by the 32-county 1918 general election. But they don't sit. They're kept in the background. They're not allowed to run our own affairs the way we should as a sovereign republic. You know, and there's a lot to be said for that. You know, we, we've got this country in such a mess. And you look at what's going on there with Apollo House, for example. And that's something I'm going to be talking about in a couple of minutes. Apollo House... I had one big problem there before Christmas. They went to court and of course they did. They got an injunction against them. They've got to get out by the 11th. And Vin from People's Internet Radio quite rightly pointed out on Facebook, he'd put it out there, that they need to refer to Apollo House as a dwelling. Because a dwelling is the only thing that has any sort of protection in the Constitution. A home, a house, a building, they don't have any protection under the Constitution. Only the word dwelling does. You know, I remember I was at a court case there last year and um, there was a lady, she go, I won't mention her name, she was in court facing eviction, the poor woman. Um, it didn't go away in the end, but one thing I did notice, and this was in the High Court, one thing I noticed was under no circumstances would the judge or the barristers or anyone fighting for the banks or fighting for the state mention the word dwelling, because they knew, and they knew quite well that the word dwelling meant they would have to step forward and afford such a dwelling, the constitutional protection that it it has, that it, it deserves. And this was the problem that Vane from People's Internet Radio pointed out in relation to Apollo House Day Before Christmas. They weren't referring to it as a dwelling. You know, they were saying it's a place to live for the homeless, it's, you know, a hostel, call it whatever you want. But if it's not getting called a dwelling, it's got no protection. You know, none whatsoever. I mean, it's like I just mentioned there to the guy that was on before me, Dave, um, Article 41.1.1 of the Constitution in relation to the family. And it's a great article. If you read the literal translation, you know, it basically reads that the family have more rights which are more ancient and higher than any human statute. And it, it, it gives you great protection. But only as a family. But what's the definition of a family? Husband, a wife and children. That's a family. So if you're a boyfriend and a girlfriend with kids, forget it. You, you've got no rights. You've got no protection in the Constitution whatsoever. None. And that's what's going on in this country. That's what's been going on in this country since the 1920s, since this country was usurped by progressive governments since then who are loyal, not to the people of this country. I mean, you can't honestly sit there and say that Fianna Gael, Labour, Fianna Fáil are loyal to the people of Ireland. They're not. You just have to look at their actions. You know, they're, they answer to the corporations, they answer to the Crown. They don't answer to the people of this country. That's why this country is in such a mess. I mean, this Simon Coveney had, had promised there months and months ago this rapid building um, programme for the homeless. We'll build 100,000 by the end of the year. I think they built 26, even if that. 26 houses. It's a joke. Now, I live in uh, the Crumlin area of Dublin, and I stand out in my back garden, and I look across to my right, and there's a house being built there at present, at the moment. And they started the house about two months ago. One house. Five or six guys, and they're nearly finished. Now, if they can do that in about eight weeks, what can a massive task force of people, builders... I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of builders, bricklayers, electricians, plumbers, you name it, out of work in this country. Put them to work. Get them building houses for the homeless. Just, there's the money, do it. 
You know that I've spent thousands in the dollar bar while debating the finance bill or the, debating a homeless bill or an eviction bill. You know, put this money to good use. Build houses for the homeless. Now, Apollo House, the thing about Apollo House is it's not, don't get me wrong, it's a roof over your head. But it's not really, it was never designed to, to be somewhere for people to live. It was never designed with that purpose. Maybe it can be converted and that's probably a better deal for it. It belongs to the people of Ireland anyway, via NAMA. Although NAMA do operate like a private company selling off, you know, a billion euros worth of apartments for millions of euros, which is a joke. But um, I don't think Apollo House is suitable, but maybe it can be converted and be used then on a long-term basis. Now, Michael D. Higgins, the president, has come out in support of Apollo House, which I found very, very strange. I found it very strange indeed that he would come out in support of Apollo House, but he has. Now, he's a Labour, a Labour man, Michael D. Higgins, um, and he's in the rock as president. You know, and here he is supporting Apollo House. And the reason I find it strange is because he signed the water bill into law. He signed the eviction bill into law. You know, so he was really on the side of the people. It's a bit of a... <laughs> it's a bit of a contradiction when you think about it. I mean, he's there yesterday supporting the people who have taken over Apollo House and saying, oh, you know, that I'm in full support of what's going on here. These people need a roof over their heads. And that's fair enough. That's what a president of any country should do. A president of any country should make damn sure there's no such thing as homelessness in his country. But it's a bit contradictory that the President of Ireland, not the President of Ireland, the President of Ireland, Inc., Michael D. Higgins, comes out in support of a homeless action group taking over a, a run-down empty building in support of the homeless. But yeah, he's the same, very same man who signed in to law, not that it's law, but into law, the eviction bill. It's, you know, it's like a, the, the, the playground bully setting up a security firm to make sure there's no bullying in the playground. It's, it's contradictory. But this is what's happening. You know, Michael D. Higgins, as I said, has come out in support of the people of um, Apollo House. But yeah, he's the very same man who signed into law the legislation that allows for this very thing to take place. People becoming homeless. You know, and people are lauding them all over Facebook today and social media. Oh, fair play to Michael Lee Higgins. You know, I haven't got much time for the man, but he's right on this issue. You know, fair play. Hang on a minute. Before you jump on that bandwagon, remember what this man did. He signed into law the legal framework that allows the banks to throw people out of the homes and cause homelessness. And yet here he is, championing a cause that's helping the homeless. It doesn't make bloody sense. If he really wanted to help the homeless, I'll tell you what he can do. He can open up Boris and Uteron and let the homeless live there. It's big enough. He's only a small little man. He doesn't need a big bloody house. A one-bedroom flat and fatty my mansions but they were a man his size. So give him that and give his house to the homeless. But they won't. They won't do that. Why? Because they don't care. These people don't care. You know, they know that... I think he's just gathering troops, to be honest with you, because come the 11th of January, when those people have to get out of that house, where are they going to go? I mean, the temperature's dropping to minus four tonight. What's it going to be like on the 11th of January? Is it going to be very warm? Is it going to be very cold? Is it going to be snowing? Is it going to be absolutely freezing? And you're expecting 40 people to leave Apollo House and go where? Out onto the streets? Now, how are you going to get them out of there? Are they going to go up and say, listen, we know it's freezing out there, you know, and it's, it's, it's wet and it's very cold, but should have he's got some sleeping bags? Do you mind leaving this building now and getting back out into the cold? Now, is that the humane thing to do? No, it's not. So how are they going to get them out? They're going to have to send in a heavy mob to remove them. That's what I can see happening. So to see Michael D. Higgins coming out all over the media yesterday in support of Apollo House, to me, it's, it's a disgusting move on, on their part, to be honest with you, because he's the very man who signed into law the legislation, legislative framework that allows a situation like Apollo House to arise in the first place. doesn't make sense. But um, anyway, it's the strange world we live in, folks. I'm going to go to some ads because um, I want to queue up a song. And I'm going to see if I get my guest, Christina. Um, I'm going to try and ring her during the break and see what the story is. Maybe I'll try and get her on the phone if I can. But um, what I'll do is now I will go to some ads. Just hang on a second. I'll just get rid of these. 28. There you go. Now, I'm going to go to the ads. I'm going to try and get Christina on the phone. So we'll be back in 10 minutes, folks. Take a handy. You're listening to Lithy Sound. On 96.4 FM. Now, folks, you're very welcome back. Um, I think the news is about to start there again. It's um, 
sits in the same bank there as the ads, um, I should have deleted it, but I didn't. Anyway, I am back. Now, I think Christina is online, so I'm going to try and call her in um, via Skype. She has been appearing offline, that's why I didn't see her. But um, I'm going to try and dial her number now, and hopefully she will answer. And if she does, I will get Christina on, and we can have a, a bit of a chat. So, fingers crossed, folks, this works out. Now, just before the break there, I was talking about Apollo House and the contradiction that is Michael Lee Higgins, the president, coming out in support of Apollo House and the residents um, in Apollo House when it was him himself who signed the law into being that allowed for the situation of Apollo House to arise in the first place. You know, it's a, a bit of a smack in the face. Anyway, we're going to go and see it's Christina there. Good evening, Christina. I think the news is still playing, so bear with me, folks. I'll just stop that. Now, she is on there now, so hang on a minute. Good evening, Christina. Good evening, Mick. Can ah, you're there. Me? I can indeed. Now I have you there now. Um, sorry for not getting you in there before, but you were appearing offline for some reason, and you weren't showing up on my Skype as online, so I wasn't getting the option to dial you, but I, I managed to sort it out. Anyway, a very happy new year to you, Christina, and welcome on to the show. Thank you, Mick, and a very happy new year to you and everybody listening. And I'm hoping that 2017 will be a year of change. Well, hopefully we, hopefully it will. Um, I was just talking there, just before I got you on there, about Apollo House um, and the the irony of Michael D. Higgins coming out in support of the Apollo House movement when it was he himself who signed into law the eviction bill which allows situations like Apollo House to arise in the first place. Yes, it's a bit ironic, isn't it, Mike? Like it, it, it's nuts when you really think about it. Anyway, um, I was talking about him and the problem of homelessness in this country and the austerity that we're going through in general. Um, I was talking in relation to Ireland's Independence Day and the fact that that has been suppressed for nearly 100 years now and that yes, there's very good reason for its suppression. 98. Yes, um, 98 years since the of Sovereign Dáil Éireann, the Sovereign Republic era, the Sovereign Courts and all the institutes of the state and of course we know the history what happened in 1921-22 with the um, first of all uh, King George V in England declared Dáil Éireann an illegal assembly in um, August I think it was of 1919 um, yet uh, they weren't happy with the Irish people choosing a parliament in their own country um, don't forget up to that point there was a checkered history you know it's it's huge but I don't want to deviate from the fact that it is 98 years coming up on the 21st this year and um, we'll continue to do what we do on a regular basis on an annual basis anyway um, and just to keep the whole thing alive and Can I ask you what do you say to those out there who say Come on, you know, look, it's it's 98 years, it's dead in the water now, you're never going to get anywhere. Boy, bother. What do you say to those people? Well, first and foremost, um, current boy, the rock disc that's in your house, claimed a sovereign dollar. So, I mean, they're giving it credence. They're giving the legitimacy of the state credence. But um, they're also, at the same time, usurping the legitimacy of the state, state which... Um, the sovereign republic of recognizes the people as sovereign, not the executive. Mm. And that's why annual turning was happening, you know, of the seal, because those who were given the legitimate representation of power for the people, their communities, um, came back, brought back their seal to the cabinet room um, 20 January in order for the 21st of January then to be reissued to those you know, and that's mm. how it was set up for and on behalf of the people. Now, here's a question I would think you might struggle to answer this because I have been struggling to, you know, come up with a theory as to what might transpire. With the advent of Brexit in the UK, now if, as Billy has pointed out and yourself has pointed out on many occasions, Ireland is still under the yoke of the crown via the Oireachtas. What does that mean for this country if Britain or the, the UK, or England, or whatever it has that, has, who, that wants to exit from, from the EU. What does that mean for us, considering we want to stay in the well, EU? Well, I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but um, there's been a push and a move on since 1993 in this country to have the United Ireland under the Commonwealth. And I feel that that may be the way things have been pushed forward. By the current political establishment? 
Yes, and in the north as well. It, it make you wonder, Rod. I mean, you can see what's going on up in Northern Ireland now at the moment. They're trying to push um, the DU. Is it the DUP leader? She's the first minister up there. I can't think of her name now. Um, Arlene Foster. Arlene Foster. They're trying to push her out now, which would leave Sinn Féin, you know, in a position of absolute power up there. Well, perhaps. I'm, I really don't follow politics, I'll be honest with you. I deal in sovereignty and mm. sovereignty only. But, of course, you have to keep your eyes and ears open as to what's going on. And who knows at the end. But I do know for a fact um, the, the push to bring Ireland. There are websites there that you can check this out, you know. Um, please, certainly, uh, all of your listeners, um, to actually research for themselves. But there are websites out there, um, and you can see which uh, parties, political or, or otherwise, have been pushing forward for this a united army under the Commonwealth. Mm, but not a sovereign. And I expect that that will be coming. Not a sovereign republic, you know. So do you think that's going to start happening soon, Christina? Well, it's it's been out and put out on mo- most quarters and I mean there's a lot of groups out there um, who are advocating a united Ireland and um, you know I would say just do a little bit of research on that and see which groups are promoting it mm. and um, as I'm opposed sure to what groups are promoting a sovereign all Ireland Republic there are very few doing that <laughs> well no, I know and that's the problem I mean, but uh, as you well know that's what the 32 counties voted for in 1918 and like I always say to people you know who, who will retort back and say but look it was 1918 it doesn't matter those people who voted back then are not alive anymore so what difference does it make and my point to them is well those people were voting for a sovereign independent republic not for themselves it was for you they were doing it exactly that's right. the point yes I mean if you go back to even 1916 um, the reason why they were surprising here um, was to create and to establish a sovereign republic. And it's still in the proclamation in 1916 and subsequent press release proclamations that came out of the GPO. And it's never been taken off the books, even though it's not something that's exercised in this country, unfortunately. It's not a 32 county sovereign republic. Um, it's a partition country under occupation. Well, it was a home rule for 26 counties and an apartheid. But the reason it's still there, like even in the proclamation and in the constitution, is they can't remove it without letting the cat out of the bag to all the people. That what they're doing themselves is a fraud and a massive one at that. Yes, it is. It is. They claim their legitimate from Dáil Éireann, sovereign Dáil Éireann. But we know the history, how it was imposed. The twenty-six counties and six counties were imposed upon us by threat of immediate and terrible war. Mm. Uh, and there was this fictitious treaty, which is another conversation altogether, you know, uh, about why it's a fictitious treaty, you know. Uh, but we have to roll back to why the Sovereign Republic was established. You know, we have to go back to that. Uh, why was the Sovereign Republic established? Well, the conditions the Irish people were living in and under it were subject and servant of the Crown of England. Um, for quite a long time, the Irish people have a sovereign right, and had you had asserted their right, um, go back to 1150, uh, when the harp was given by the Pope, the only English Pope, to the King of England, um, claiming he claimed then ownership and lordship of Ireland, and from that time, the Irish people have asserted their right to national. Um, sovereignty. And it goes that and we continue it, it, to do that. And it does go we, back that far as well. It and does even, go back even that further. far. And every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. And we continue to do that. I mean, we're probably one of the only nations, when you look around the world, you know, we're probably one of the only nations that has never been. I suppose I don't even like using the word beaten, but we have we are the only nation that has never, they, they, you know, the, the English can never say we beat the Irish. I mean, they tried for 800 years and they still haven't. You know, because even today, there's people like yourselves who are awake to what's actually going on. Oh, indeed. And, you know, it's not that, it's not 800 years. It's 800 years since they tried to impose themselves upon us. But there were lots of um, landmass of people who were, you know, Irish, sovereign Irish people. You know, they... they they pushed forward into the, the country, 
I mean, don't forget, um, if you look at, or if, if someone was to create a map of the imposition uh, upon this country, they would see how every generation we've fought back and said no, and we've reached it and reclaimed it. And 1916 was part of all of that. Can you see anything like that happening again, Christina? You know, I mean, you know, back in 1916 and, and prior to 1916, you know, poverty, I suppose, nationwide would have been a serious issue for most people, you know, unless you were landed gentry or you worked for landed gentry. Um, but nowadays, even though we are under austerity, you know, the majority of people have somewhere to live. they got something to eat every day and the majority of people would have televisions and whatnot and other forms of entertainment to keep them distracted. Whereas back then, people didn't. So, you know, it was probably more likely for people to mobilise against the oppression than they are today because people don't know they're oppressed today. They don't notice it as much. Exactly right. And I suppose part of that would be that we do have services in this country, you know, where if if you need some form of help, that there is um, a state benefit there mm. for you to collect on a weekly basis. It's really not enough. It's not efficient. I mean, we have a very... <coughs> Um, we have a very wealthy nation here. Our, our um, resources are worth trillions. Mm. And the people should be benefiting from that. There shouldn't be homelessness. There shouldn't be, you know, the need to stand in a dole queue once a week to get a few shekels, really. It's... it's yeah, because, I mean, basically, that's what you are. You know, we hear so many people giving out about unemployed people and whatnot. You know, they seem to think unemployed people have a good. They don't. All they've got is enough just to get by on on a weekly basis. Well, that's it. They have... I mean, there are other benefits for rent allowance and stuff like that, too. But, um, been, unfortunately, it's been diluted. more people we take into this country, the more, um, you know, and I'm all on for all other nations living among us. But, you know, we have to look after our own people as well. Mm. And um, I'm going back quite a few years. I remember going in to visit somebody uh, in Limerick and I went in, they were in um, a social welfare office and I went in to see them because I was down visiting my daughter in college there. And the place was foreign people who were being handed out money every week. And she was struggling. She was struggling. She was begging for a few shekels, as I've said as an Irish person, mm. you know. So there are elements of the system that has been orchestrating Agenda 21. I'm sure I know all of your listeners know about that. And, 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 you know, taking in people into the country and exporting our young people is all part of that, that Agenda 21. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that myself playing now. Um, no, you can so see. we're living in a diluted nation now where the Irish people themselves, yes, you can see it. You can see it in every little town and village in this country. You know, Irish people, our people are suffering as a result. And this yeah. is another orchestrated famine that, you know, and genocide of our people. I was. Uh, I'm, I had like, you was talking about Irish towns and that been decimated. I was I just had reason there to, over the uh, Christmas to drive down to Wicklow and I passed through a couple of towns down there, Delgany and um, Newtown, Mount Kennedy, and I was shocked at the, the lack of people on the streets down there. There was a few shops open, but there was no one out. And, and so many empty buildings. Mm. I mean, here's here's the situation. In every town in this country, there are empty buildings. And, I, I, you know, you started your show talking about Apollo House. And, of course, the, it, they should be utilised for the homeless. There should be no homeless people. There should be nobody sleeping out on the streets for whatever reason. And it's not all about drug-related use or alcoholics or people who have other issues. These are genuine homeless people, mm. homeless um, because they don't have a home for a reason. You know, but unfortunately those people do come, come, come under for um, a lot of stick if they do turn to drugs and alcohol because of homelessness, you know. Well, you know, people do look down the noses possible. at them, unfortunately, rather than look at them as the victims of this austerity. That's, it's, it's the austerity that has put them in that position, in my opinion, in the first place, because most people's problems always stem from finances, I think, anyway. Yes, a huge amount. I mean, if you look at abuse in the home or alcoholism in the home or drug problems in the home, it usually is a case of pressure or stress or something. Mm. Um, I'm being very broad here now, and I have to apologise for that, but certainly in the past I have witnessed that it is from, um, you know, pressures, financial or otherwise, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, working in a, in a job, you're just... 
um, getting a little bit above the breadline. You know, and, and our services, our social services in this country are appalling at the moment. You know, people who are long term unemployed because there's no here, you go into the hospital in this country, whether it's into your local restaurant for a cup of coffee or whatever, and there's someone foreign mm. serving you. It's the same in the hotels, in yeah. the restaurants, you know, in most shops around the country. There are foreign people working at it, and our Irish people are, have no work. Yeah, I think an element of that as well, though, um, and this is just my opinion, is that, unfortunately, you know, the, these foreign people as well who are working in the, the catering industry and hotel industry are being exploited themselves by the owners of these establishments, by being paid a lesser wage than an Irish person is willing to accept. But also the, the owners of the businesses are getting a grant to employ a foreign person, you know? Yeah. Equal opportunities and all of that. So they get a grant or they get some form of a tax-free allowance. There's an incentive there for them to take in um, a, a non-national. Yeah, it's wrong when you think about it. It really is wrong. But as you so said, you know, we, we need to look out our own force, but we don't. Well, we don't because they're exported um, to be looked after somewhere else. Yeah. To dilute populations of the world so that um, we all speak in the one tongue. We all, you know, inter intermingle with each other and have children who will all have the same colour skin. You know, all of that. I'm all on for diversity. I'm all on for culture. I'm all on for uh, individual nations' languages. And this was part of one of the reasons why I was very much anti-EU and us becoming a, a member state, even within the 26 mm. counties of the EU. My biggest problem with the last 40 years of Agenda 21 and, you know, the European Union experiment or whatever you want to call it, um, is, like I've seen, I wasn't born in this country, Christina. You know, this is the ironic thing. I was actually born in Germany. Now, to Irish parents, but I was born in Germany. I didn't come to this country till I was six years old. So, you know, I wasn't born into this country and got used to it that way. I, I seen this country from the outside when I moved in. I seen things were different than what I'd been used to before. And what I've seen this country go through is, from someone who grew up in the, the late 70s, early 80s in the Dublin South inner city, I was exposed to a lot of, um, you know, Celtic music. You know, there would, would be festivals going on every month and stuff like that, like Smithfield, the, the Horse Fair, and every year there was one on James Street, a Horse Fair up there, and they're all gone. All these community yes. events are gone. The Irishness is gone over Ireland now. Well, they were deliberately gone, in my opinion. You know, I again, Smithfield is a prime example of... You know, there was an orchestrated stabbing or shooting there. Mm. You know, um, they closed down. So you can't actually get in to Smithfield Market. You're in barriers. I mean, they have it once a month now. It's a facade. Yeah, They're it's... trying to do the same with, Span you know, the, the Spansel Hill and various other old fairs. Now, you see, in this country, we had um, a lot of what were called Anoks. They were fairs, ancient fairs. Mm. Okay. Hundreds of years old. Smithfield would have been one of them. Spansale, other fairs still ongoing today. Um, that are they they call they go for hundreds of years, and basically, um, there are bylaws for attending these. And part of the original ancient laws are that if you're going to and from any of these old fairs, you can't be stopped and you can't be prevented. That's all part of the bylaws of the fairs. Now, we can invoke those bylaws again today. We have every right to do so. They were there a lot longer than the regime that is currently holding things. Yeah, I mean, these, as you know, well, now these fairs go back hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Yes, and they had bylaws that can still be invoked. You know, I regularly travel around the country, as you know, Mick, and, you know, go to various different communities and towns and villages and all of that. And I would attend fairs. I always disseminate information as often as I possibly can at them. And I've seen so many people being searched. Yeah. For whatever reason, a huge guard of presence at these fairs now. I mean, we are turning into a police state. I mean, even around the corner from me, um... On a, it's a road in Crumlin, there was a checkpoint yesterday and they're all armed to the teeth, right? Yes. Now, fair enough, we've, we had the, the Regency Hotel shooting last February and then, boom, everything, all hell broke loose. It was sort of reminiscent to me of the aftermath of the Veronica Gillian shooting 20 years ago, the way the state went mad, you know, we set up all these agencies and we'll do this, that and the other, you know, and 
you know, the Criminal Assets Bureau was set up, but now they've set up this new guard unit. They're all under the teeth. They all look like Robocop. And my question is this. Who's shooting at the guards? Nobody. Nobody. And yet they're going around now dressed like Robocop. Yes, and that's all part of the Euro agenda that, yeah. you know, being, being shoved upon us. And if you look around the country at the security services, say, for example, on the Lewis, at mm. the train stations, they were all foreign. They would have foreign. no compunction in... You know, I've heard this said before, you know, the reason you have foreign armies in certain nations, like if you had the UN in America, they'd have no problem shooting Americans. And I think the same could happen here. Exactly right. And these guys are being trained up to the hilt. Um, they're not carrying weapons at the moment, but they will soon will be. They look like the Gestapo. In actual fact, I, last year I was rushing to get onto my train and I didn't get a ticket. I said, I'll get one on the train. You know, Which is, is a, a traditional thing in this country for people in a hurry to do. Exactly. Yeah. And even still, if you're running, the, the, the guy who's in the station master will, will tell you, get it on the train, you'll be fine. Mm. You know, go on, get your train. I got, nobody came around. I went up and down, nobody came around. So when I got to Houston Station in Durham to get out, I went up to the little box and I said to the guy who happened to be Irish, wearing Irish rail, um, I explained what happened and I said, I travel regularly, I'm not a freeloader and I'm here to pay for my ticket. He said, go on, you're grand, but don't let the Gestapo see you. <laughs> <laughs> and he meant guys, yes. Yeah. And he meant those guys with their trousers tucked in to their boots their caps, their stab-proof vests. Maybe yeah. they're bulletproof, but they certainly are. And they're all saying I on the back of their jackets as well. Exactly. Yeah, I've exactly. seen that before. And they're everywhere. They are, they're all you over know, the news the as well. The hospitals, they're in the hospitals. We'll soon have them in the Dole office if we don't have them yet. Um, you know, and all the institutes will have them. You'd wonder what's and really going on. Foreign, and they'll all be part of the UN agenda. The UN... Um, um, Agenda 30 now, is it known as a 30 now? It's uh, agenda 20, 30, yes. Well, Which listen, I need to go to a quick outbreak, Christina, so do you mind hanging on the line for a minute? That's fine. Brilliant. Folks, we'll be back in two minutes with Christina. Local programmes, local presenters, local news. Tunes at Lithy Sound 96.4 FM. Now, folks, you're very welcome back. Christina, you're still with me, aren't you? Sorry, I had you on uh, mute. Oh, you had me on mute. <laughs> no, I had you on a different fader, so you didn't actually need to do that. Or I know I used to do that before as well, but we've got another computer here now with all the ads on it as well, so I can play it off a different fader and it doesn't affect you. Now, just before okay. we do go, I've got about 10 minutes left, Christina, because um, I did get you on a bit late today, unfortunately. Um, you missed the first quarter of the show. Um, that was down to Skype. Um, the medal ceremony that we were talking about just before um, Christmas when you were on for five minutes on the, the show I done with Freeman, um, you've done a presentation down in Tipperary. You, you presented some real All Oil medals to the winning team, as opposed to the the new All Oil medals that are out today, and which with the three serpents on them, and they, they look like something out of a pound shop. Indeed, they did, and we felt it was very, very important to first and foremost um, make the players aware of what happened in two thousand and eight. And um, I'll be honest, a lot of people that we've spoken to over the years were unaware of the medal change for the Sam Maguire and Lee McCarthy Cups. Um, so I suppose that planted the seed back then that we needed to do something about it and what better way w was to make the medals. So we had gold and silver donated, which was a, a fantastic donated gold and silver. And we held a raffle to raise some money for the payment of making of the, the medals. OK, we, we had the medal, fabulous. Um, but we had to have someone to um, melt the gold and the silver and create these absolutely beautiful, really beautiful medals. Um, so I suppose it's been a coming, you know. Um, it wasn't something that just was, OK, let's do this. We had, we had a bit of work to do in order to get that much done. So um, we started off campaigning to bring the awareness out. And um, I want to thank so many people who actually made this happen. Um, those who stood outside Croke Park year in, year out, handing out flyers. And the flyers showed the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. So anytime there was an All-Ireland final coming up, whether it's hurling or football, 
um, we felt it was important to get the information out to the people attending the games. Now, I think you can uh, go we, to BillyMcGuire.com. You can actually see the medals, the new medals. I think there's photographs up there of them, isn't there? There is, but the photographs really don't do them justice. The medal is the, has the original curve on it from 1910. It's not a flat medal. Um, the craftsmanship is absolutely stunning. Um, it's for essentially um, with gold inlay of the sovereign seal with era underneath. We had boxes made, uh, presentation boxes made as well and gilded. Um, so, I mean, it did cost us a fair bit of money, but we wanted to thank the the kind people who donated money towards that and the people who bought tickets. And we held a raffle, as you're aware, mm. down at our AGM. And we had three prizes. And the first prize went to a lady in Dublin by the name of Barbara Franzoni. The second prize, a guy from Wicklow, um, a Richard Norton, won. And a guy from Cork won um, the third prize, Nick O'Reardon. Um, and it just kind of proves that people from all ends of the country, north, south, east and west, contributed to have these made. It was really a people power, a people push to have them made. So we were we were invited down to the um, the commemoration that they were having down in Tipperary with uh, Tipperary GAA. We were invited to attend um, down there to present these medals. Um, they were winners of the senior and minor All-Ireland Championship and Munster titles as well. So they were having a prize-giving ceremony um, for all of these events, and our medals were put in there as well. And Billy presented the medals. And I have to say, I was so delighted for Billy Maguire after all these years mm. um, and all his hard work um, to see him standing there. I stood back just to watch that moment. It was fabulous. And well-deserved as well from Billy. I mean... You know, I've seen the way he's been treated, you know, by the, the powers that be up here in the mansion house, namely a couple of years ago when he wasn't allowed in. I thought, you know, how disgusting of these people. But, you know, we had a Fianna Gael mayor in there at the time, I think it was, or a Labour mayor. It wasn't certain, it wasn't a Sinn Féin one. And fair play to uh, yeah. Christina Nidali last year. Now, I know Christina personally. Um, we, go, we go way back. She's a, a good friend of my cousin's. Um, and she got me my house, <laughs> you know, for wonderful about award. She's yeah. a great woman, Christina. And I was delighted yeah. when she got the, the, the mayorship of Dublin. Um, she should be a 10 year old mayor, in my opinion. But that's neither here nor there. Um, she was a great Lord Mayor and the IRB were invited back into the Mansion House last year and quite rightly so. And I had the honour yes. of being there myself. Yes. Now, again, that wasn't an easy process, you know. Um, go back to Oisin Quinn's time when he was Lord Mayor. Yeah. He was putting stipulations, oh, you're only allowed 20 people into the room, all of that. Now, um, we felt at that time it was very important that everybody attend. Mm. You know, we, we tried to get the round room to hire it even, but it was really just too expensive. Plus, it was booked up. It has been booked up every year. Mm. Now, we've since discovered who has booked it up. <laughs> uh, you know, so you never know. We may be able to negotiate with them and have a crowd in to the round room, as it was. A ceremony, um, in, in my opinion, as, as significant as that, should be broadcast live on the television. It should be live. You know, it's it this, to me anyway, as an Irishman, this, you know, a, a, an Englishman would identify, it's as big as the Queen's speech as far as I'm concerned. Well, indeed, Mick, but you have to... And should be held in the same reverence as the English Holder Queen's speech. Exactly. And, you know, um, as soon as this um, occasion put its head above the parapet in the minds and the hearts of a lot of people, and it's, I have to say the internet helped big time because we could... You take video footage and all and put it up on YouTube. But as soon as it did, you have the controlled opposition who want this information buried. Because basically, the ceremony is about respecting the individual people mm. as sovereign people. And the nation as a sovereign nation. Yeah. And it also respects the natural resources and the land of Ireland that belongs to the people of Ireland and to them alone. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what, and of course we're going to get knocked down. You saw yourself over the years the controlled opposition, and you know, oh, it's some Masonic ritual. Yeah, I've, 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 I've had this conversation. Masonic ritual in my life. Yeah, I've had this conversation. Like. But people have said to me, you know what, Billy McGuire is a Freemason and all that, and you know what, and I've said to them, you know what, so bloody what, even if he was, I said, I don't know if he is or not, and I said, but so what? What he's actually saying in that ceremony is that this country and all its resources belong to the people and the people alone. What is wrong with that? Whether he's a bloody mason or not. Nothing. Well, you, and you that's the information that's been suppressed. 
you can be guaranteed the Freemasons won't be saying that. But they, well, they never <laughs> you know, have. have um, but look, all all of that aside, so much bad press. There's no such thing as bad press, really, because the more people try to study the whole concept and the purity of sovereignty, yeah. they're actually doing themselves harm well, and their enough. fellow yeah, human being, enough. their fellow man. You know, every child on the planet is born sovereign and they have a right to live. And this is what's so it's important the about the Irish side of things. And I've said this to people before. You know, if we here in this country can regain our sovereignty, not that we've given it away, but to re-establish it and get it out there to everybody and, and turn this into a sovereign republic, a proper sovereign republic, can you imagine what kind of an inspiration that would be for the rest of the world? Indeed, indeed. Because, and I, I do believe that we can do it, you know. Well, why not? Um, I, I mean, look look what's going to happen now. I've seen um, on social media that there are going to be demonstrations on the 21st of January uh, this year. Yes, I, I was wondering about that myself. And just get out into the street and have a bit of crack and bring music, bring balloons, yeah. and let's have a carnival and a party. Let's not go in dishonour and shouting and roaring and being angry about something. Because get let's come out and celebrate our independence. And that, you know, the powers let's that turn be... turn it into a Mardi Gras and a bit of a festival out on the streets because they're your streets yep. belonging to you, the sovereign people. We can have a private event out on the streets. Now, you, you know, you can imagine, like, what the... The powers that be want. They want people out shouting and roaring on the streets and, you know, getting aggravated. But as you says, get out there and have a Mardi Gras because this will get up the nose of those who want well, trouble on the day, you know. Well, I think anybody who causes trouble... They have no place in Dublin on the 21st of this month. Well, first and foremost, they're not accepting their own sovereignty and they're not respecting every, anyone else's. No, and they've just been arseholes. Let's call it what it is. You know, we don't need that, that in this country. Paid, you know, you we've know. got enough assholes running this country without getting them out on the streets, protesting on behalf of ordinary, decent people. Yes. OK, people have issues and people are angry. There's no doubt about it. The water issue brought communities yeah. together, and I have to thank Irish Water for that, because we did need something to unite the people to say no from, yeah. and a great platform, you know, to be able to disseminate information. And as you know, we've been at every march that's going handing out information to the people saying, well, look, there are ways and means to reclaim your sovereignty and not contracting with the likes of a private company like... Is Irish the way to do it. Is the way to do it. Yeah. And here's So collectively, the people who didn't contract, because you go up and down the country, there was no contract, no consent mm. in their windows, no water meters here. They were putting people... They were putting Irish water on no notice, no implied right of access yeah. here to a, install a water meter. All of that. It was heartening to see that that information got out to the people. We yeah. knew it was coming, and we got out there in advance mm. to spur on the people to unite. Yeah, and, I'd heard old women. I'd heard old women who would never be involved in something like that. You know, I protest saying. I've no contract with Irish Water. You can't lawfully make me get into a contract because I don't know the ins and outs. I was saying, you know, they're learning. You know, even at that age, people are copping on and they know what a contract is now. So, yes. you know, for them to try and foist another one upon the people, I think is going to be very difficult. I think so. And no matter what it is, um, you know, go back to our provisional government as well and use that lesson there. No contract, no consent. We yeah. do not consent to what's happening at the moment. Well, as you said at the top of the show, Michael D. Higgins signing the eviction bill. Yeah, and then going out and support the Bono House. We don't consent to that. We don't. Now, Enda Kenny says it himself, look what happened in the last election. He didn't even get elected, but yet he's become um, the Taoiseach of the 26th County Royal Oireachtas. Yeah. You know, um, how did that happen? He stated that he got his mandate from the electorate. Now, who are the electorate? Really those careful. who are registered to vote. Yeah. Not just to, those who vote for him or for their favourite politician. Those who are registered, whether you vote or not, you have given him your mandate. Yeah. So remove it. No consent. No consent. Take. I'm not telling anyone what to do, but what I did... And what I found was very effective, and it actually was a breath of fresh air, was I deregistered. I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not giving place. them my mandate, so I'm taking it away. And exercising it as a sovereign. Exactly. Which is, the, uh, which is your sovereign right to do. Exactly. And exactly. people need to realise that, what sovereignty actually is. Well, listen, yeah. Christine, I have come to the end of the show. Um, it is a minute to ten, so I have to wrap things up. 
Um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming on and a very happy new year to you. Thank you very, very much. And I look forward to seeing people on the 21st. At the Mansion House, 12 we're not, at, Well, we're not sure how things will go at the moment. Well, sure, I'll keep the listeners informed anyway if I get more information between now and then. So You will indeed. I'm hoping to meet up with Darren anyway in the next couple of days. So he, he trashing out a few things and I'll let the listeners know what's going on. Thank you so much. All right. Much. Thanks very much for saying that and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Okay, bye-bye. 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 Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking Brotherhood. Now, as she just said there, um, we will have the turning of the sovereign sale on the 21st of January in the Mansion House. Hopefully, it will be going ahead. Um, if not, it could be happening somewhere else. But anyway, I'll keep you informed of what's going on. So, from me, this is the end of the show. And the first show of 2017, I just want to wish all my listeners a very, very happy new year. And I hope it's the best one yet. Um, so, we'll see how it goes. So, anyway, until next week, folks, this has been The World You Don't Know. Take a handy and I'll talk to you all very soon. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connell.